um, so yeah, so um, you know that that's an expectation of mine. If you don't need the help, that's fine, uh, no big deal. Uh, but uh, don't uh, the the intention is not that you're out there in the wilderness all alone trying to do this project and uh, cussing and swearing at me for uh, you know just dumping you dumping this on you and expecting you to figure out everything yourself. So uh, the uh, I've got lots of different background. I don't know everything, obviously, but uh, I've got lots of background in a lot of these different uh, topic areas. So um, um, happy to to help with that. So please uh, feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, so also on the FMCW radar uh, project, and a little bit on the common. Let me let me talk about the common filter uh, thing first. So um, uh, most of y'all have turned that in, and I've given feedback on most of y'all. Um, uh, and there's there's a few stragglers. And um, even though I'm not really enforcing due dates, I just encourage you to uh, kind of keep up uh, reasonably so. So um, that that helps you and also helps me. So um, the uh, Coleman filter, you know, one of the things that I saw and maybe I, I should maybe make this explicit next time I teach this course is, you know, what would be interesting is after you've kind of, you know, built your filter, um, either, uh, you know, bootstrapped a little simulation around a library call, I think uh, is what I was making available, you know, the expectations for the undergraduate, um, uh, course and the graduate course uh, is more of writing your own custom code. It's not a ton of lines of code, so uh, as, as most of you all have figured out. Um, but then I think what's you know really interesting, and I didn't really see this happening, and like I say, I'll, I'll own that for not suggesting it, but I'll suggest it now. Is uh, you know when you do something like that, look at what the filter is doing, and then play with it a little bit. Uh, right. So, what is the common filter doing? Well, it's it's trading off the uh, the process or or uh, update noise, right? So, in in our case, that's typically a mobility uh, type event, right? So, we're we're moving at some velocity vector, and uh, but there's some noise associated with that, right? And then we measure the position, and there's some noise associated with that, right? And so that's more of a, a control systems type of uh, situation where we're uh, uh, trying to trade off the uh, system or you know, mobility noise and the measurement noise, right? And then also a uh, common filter can be used to fuse two different sensors, right? So we can fuse uh, the um, perhaps low resolution, coarse, noisy, wheel encoder uh, uh, type information uh, with GPS, which is generally pretty good, but not always available if you're in a tunnel or, or something like that, right? So uh, each sensor has kind of pros and cons, and the common filter can uh, optimally fuse those, right, to, to get the best of uh, uh, the information out of the system. So, um, so what you might do is change in your simulation, change the amount of noise that you're introducing in your measurement and see how that affects your convergence and that type of thing. So uh, as you get into you know, your uh, higher level electives or graduate program or off into your career, um, these are the type of things that you want to look at. Right and uh, to to understand things. Why do you build up simulation so you can understand the thing that you're simulating? And uh, so you have certain inputs to it. So tweak some of those inputs. Tweak the variance of the measurement noise in particular, and see how does that how does uh, the Coleman filter adapt to all of that? So um, so it's just some feedback on that on the. Um, FMCW radar uh, assignment, uh, you know, you, you might want to, I, I programmed up all the equations in the MATLAB script. Uh, you could do that in MATLAB, Python, Excel, whatever, right? So they're all pretty simple equations. 
uh, in the end, I do want to see your work, though. Uh, so a few of you all have turned things in, and uh, you've just turned it in a table, and with with the data and a little bit, of, you know, the part two comment on on how the chip, uh, the TI chip, could meet those uh, requirements or not. And uh, well, in some of those cases, your values are different from my values, and I don't see your work in order to be able to try to figure out, you know, what's what's going on there and stuff. So uh, please, please show your work. Uh, so you know, an assignment. Uh, anytime you're turning things in academically or professionally or whatever, you want some sort of uh, title and date and name and that type of thing. A little bit of introduction, a little bit of review on uh, what you did, uh, you know, it's a lab report, right? So you, you adjust these things. Um, I don't tend to turn in lab reports to a boss or anything like that professionally, but you're still turning in uh, work. So, um, you know, want to see things in context and stuff. So, um, all right. So uh, hopefully all that makes sense. Let's go ahead and dive into uh, lectures now. So, um, start presentations and so uh last week we uh talked about neural networks and uh looked at how tensorflow and keras um can implement things we talked about python and and stuff um and then we just got started with looking at convolutional neural networks and the i concepts associated with object detection so we'll we'll pick up there and uh then we'll as um kind of review and advancement uh we'll look at convolutional neural networks over volumes and then we'll look at um another kind of key layer in uh typical uh deep neural networks that are associated with uh computer vision Right. And uh, that's Max Booling. And uh, then we'll look at metrics. How do we assess how well we're doing with our model and our training regime, our hyperparameters, and that type of thing? Um, and even whether we've got a good data set or not uh, that we're working with. And then uh, we'll dive a little deeper into object detection and then briefly talk about segmentation. Um, and then uh, part two, we'll look at some of the challenges. It's a, a different slide deck, but that'll be the uh, challenges associated with deep neural networks when we go actually deep in many, many layers. And um, so we'll look at the challenges and some of the solutions and then a uh, couple of examples. So, um, all right, so object detection, I think we left on this slide last time. And the idea here is that um, an object detection algorithm should output a uh, class uh, identification of interesting objects, right? So if we're looking for cars, stoplights, trucks, motorcycles, bicyclists, pedestrians, right? We should uh, be able to find all of those type of objects within the image that the camera is providing us. And uh, be able to classify things as such, right? That this uh, this is a car, not a pedestrian, right? And uh, we're also providing a bounding box, which uh, roughly, hopefully better uh, than roughly, but uh, uh, roughly encloses the uh, extents of the object. Right, so, uh, and we see uh, that might vary depending upon where we're getting a profile view or an end-on view of uh, a vehicle, right? So uh, this car, this car here looks very different from this car here because we're getting a different view of it, right? And uh, the bounding box is a different shape and, and that type of thing also, right? So, uh, and it should also give us a probability of um, confidence that that is what 
we think it is, right? So um, we haven't really gone into how we get probabilities out on neural networks. Um, uh, there's a, a last layer called a softmax layer, which we often use to uh, give us uh, probabilities. When we label things, they're either labeled with uh, zero, like there's there's nothing here, right? It's just background, or a, a one, and that we're as a human labeler, we're, uh, we would label this car as a, a one, that it's a car. Uh, so we're 100% confident. And then label it with this bounding box. But when we're inferring, uh, we, we may not have a ton of confidence, right? 90%, 50%, or 70%, or something like that, right? So uh, that's the type of information we want out of a system. And we want to be able to handle multiple objects um, of the same class and uh, multiple objects of different classes, right? So uh, all at the, out of the same model system, ideally. All right, so uh, let's take a, a brief step back and review uh, convolutional neural networks. And that's where uh, last week we talked about we would have some pixel array. In this case, it's just a tiny six pixels uh, by six pixels. And then um, we would convolve that with the filter. And we could have uh, certain values in this filter that might highlight edges, might accentuate edges uh, or curves or, or something like that, right? So you might have a ones in a column and then zeros and minus ones or, or something like that to, um, to accentuate uh, a vertical edge, or maybe you run it horizontally or diagonally to try to find these different edges. And uh, you could handcraft these, but in uh, machine learning, we let the machine uh, train to that, right? Through back propagation, we're going to create these filters in order to ultimately get the results that we want, right? And so we saw that, well, this is a three by three filter and that we would overlay that three by three filter over the input image. And then we would multiply element by element and sum it up. And that would be our first value, right? And then we would shift over one and repeat and that would be our second value shift over again and that would give us our third value and shift over a fourth time and we'd be at this edge uh the far right edge and we would get a value there and then we keep uh step down and repeat and um implementation sometimes we do a stride of greater than one right so a stride is how far we step over and down at um at each interval. So uh, what I just described would be a stride of one. We moved over one pixel until we got to the end, and then we dropped down one pixel. You don't have to do that. You can do a stride of two or three. Uh, <laughs> and um, so there's various reasons to do that. Uh, just kind of pointing it out, we might see that uh, a little bit later. So uh, that was all one uh, one uh image right but uh we generally familiar with cameras and that we uh often get an rgb uh for red green blue outputs out of our cameras uh, a few different color standards or formats but rgb is uh is the the common one that we tend to work with right so maybe we want to kind of highlight what's going on in red or uh, or green or, or something like that. So really we could have three different filters um, that are each matching up with each of these uh, uh, different components of the image. Now, uh, when we start adding this extra dimension out here, we call that a different channel, right? So this would have three channels and uh, so we would convolve that with a, a filter that has three channels. Now, when we get a result here, we're going to add all of these things up, right? So remember, we, we multiply element by element on these three by three 
you know, uh, cubes or, or cells here. And, uh, but then now that we have three channels, we're going to repeat that three times and then sum all those values up, right? So this, uh, this convolution at that first step is going to provide one value. So all, uh, all these, uh, nine cells, uh, times three are going to three channels are all going to sum to one value right uh so uh then it turns out we can have multiple filters right so we can add another filter down here and also convolve it right and and uh isolation but in parallel to what this so yellow filters are doing, right? So we can have these purple filters. These can be different. Maybe this one's looking for horizontal lines. Maybe this one's looking for vertical lines or diagonal lines or, or corners or, or something like that, right? And then that's going to produce that output. Well, we're going to range these into a set of channels also. And typically what we see in these... Uh, convolutional neural networks for image uh, computer vision image processing is that we're going to uh, start with large dimension um, uh, images, right? So this might be a megapixel type of thing, right? So it might be a thousand by a thousand um, that is often overkill, but uh, it could still be, you know, uh, a uh, hundred by a hundred or, or something like that, right? And uh, it just depends on the application, right? So we might have a uh, several megapixel um, uh, type imager. And so we start off with very high dimensions, but only three channels. And uh, in this filtering process, when we cascade a number of these layers together, right? What we tend to end up with is smaller dimensions here so this is going to shrink from maybe a thousand by a thousand down to a much smaller, uh, much, much smaller uh, uh, XY dimensions, let's say. But we're going to include more and more channels. So um, uh, we're still gathering lots of information, right, uh, while we're consolidating it. And uh, in any given channel, we're consolidating or generalizing information but we're providing lots of channels so we can uh, have uh, all that information still in our system. All right, so we also find in a lot of these implementations, successful models uh, use what's called a max pooling layer. And I introduced this briefly when we looked at how Keras uh, can build things. We did a sequential model, and uh, I think there was some max pooling layers and errors uh, somewhere we looked at it, right? So. Uh, uh, here, what we're going to do is, uh, let's say this is a max pool of two by two. So what we're going to do is we're for every uh, two by two um, uh, thing in this uh, source image, uh, we're going to take the maximum value and we're going to retain that in one cell. So here we have one, five, six, eight, and that maximum value is eight. Then we step over and we look at three, eight, nine, four. Well, the maximum value is nine. Let's, uh, we keep stepping over. Here we have seven, four, five, two. So the maximum value is seven. We plug that in. And we step down and we look at one, six, seven, six, maximum value is seven. Uh, we step across and step down one more time and we got two eight seven nine so maximum value of, of nine right so uh, a max pooling layer is uh, going to uh, kind of reduce the size of the dimensions here while uh, taking the maximum uh, value out of those, right? So very, very common implementation is cascade a convolutional layer with the subsequent max pooling layer, and then possibly a dropout layer, which we'll talk about uh, later, and then repeat, right? So we'll cascade a whole bunch of these together. So uh, we haven't talked extensively. I think I mentioned uh, dropout layer when we looked at Keras, but uh, we haven't really talked about 
what that does. So you can just think of a uh, convolutional layer followed by a Macapulene layer and now cascade a whole bunch of those together. All right, so uh, before we go on too, too much farther, let's talk about how we evaluate our, um, our neural networks. And uh, we're gonna do this mostly in uh, the context of object detection. And we'll need a few of these metrics as we start to evaluate uh, how object detection works and how we can we can and improve it. So um, machine learning has come a long ways, but we're so far from perfect. Humans are imperfect, right? So why would we expect machine learning to be absolutely perfect, right? So uh, it's not a matter of uh, slapping something together and saying, okay, it works, great, we're done. Uh, no, you, you put something together, you evaluate how it's working, and you go back and uh, adapt it, tweak it, change it and uh, continue working with it until your metrics are gonna meet your objectives, uh, whatever uh, that uh, specifications are for your system, or you know, typically in engineering, we're, uh, we're trying to optimize something, but we're always doing that within some constraints. And you always have some sort of schedule and cost, uh, cost constraints. So, um, you know, you might have some other constraints in terms of compute hardware, power consumption, that type of thing, right? So, uh, but we want to uh, use various metrics to quantitatively assess how well our models, not just our models, but also how we're doing our training, um, you know, our, our hyperparameters, what kind of um, um, optimization function did we use, what kind of loss function we used, how we put together our data set. Uh, maybe we need a more uh, diverse data set or uh, that type of thing, right? So all these things that go into actually developing a model, uh, we want to assess how well we're doing at solving the ultimate problem. So uh, just to get started, we have this uh, concept of bias and variance. And uh, this compares how well the model does on training versus test sets. So if you, you're you taking a, uh, or you have taken a um, focused machine learning or AI uh, course, you're gonna dive into this in a lot of detail, right? So uh, again, we're more at the applied level, so we're gonna skim over it a little bit, but it's uh, still very important to understand these ideas of overfitting or underfitting and what we call high variance and, and high bias. So uh, at the end of the day, when you're looking at your results of your model runs, uh, you might end up with a low training set error. And uh, that's going to be... Um, uh, good, right? So it's good that as we train the model that we ultimately got a very low error. But um, then when we throw our test set, or sometimes it's called a dev set, uh, we might have a validation set also, but you know, just generic terms for data that we've withheld from our uh, training set. So we can you know, have a set of data that we train with, and then we can evaluate how well that's doing by by tossing at some test data at it right so if we end up with a high test set uh, error even when we've had this uh, low training set error that's an indication that we have high variance or we've overfit so kind of the the classical type of uh uh, thing here is where, uh, you know, you might look at some data in uh, two-dimensional uh, two data, and we've got two different classes here, right? And uh, so let's see, we might uh, come up with some sort of decision boundary that does that, right? And um, uh, that might train for a really good uh, you know, uh, test uh, training data set. But this type of thing out here, you know, that's 
maybe that's an outlier or something and we kind of overfit to it um and so uh we might have done better just to kind of generalize a line that looked more like that and so uh that way uh when we throw new data at it it's more likely to classify correctly right so uh that uh, we call this high variance and that uh ends up with uh an overfitting type of thing right so uh then we also have a situation where well we might just have high training set error right so uh now if oops oh, i'm lost okay so um I'm trying to erase it, but it's not letting me. Uh, I guess I'll erase that. Erase it this way. Um, so we we might have uh, some uh, data here, and we just you know toss a decision boundary right there. Well, we've got lots of errors in that case, right? And so uh, if we have still a lot of, uh, you know, error in our training set data, and maybe, you know, we still toss some uh, uh, dev set, uh, 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 test set at it, and uh, it, probably has a little bit more error than the training set, but it's on the same order of magnitude, then that's likely to be underfit, right? And then uh, we have a situation where we have high training set error, and then we have even higher, much higher test set error, right? So we might have high bias and variance. Um, this is where we want to be over here, low bias and low variance, right? So. We're, we're low on both of these things, right? So all this is typically relative to human performance, right? So there's some, some tasks that are really easy and um, even, you know, for humans and for machines and some uh, tasks that are really hard even for humans to do, right? And so, uh, so a lot of times when we talk about whether something's high or low, um, in, in some cases, uh, uh, 15 percent error might be great and in other cases uh you know 15 percent error might be terrible right so um all right now um uh, you'll also run into uh something called the confusion matrix and uh this kind of shows up in uh statistics and that type of thing also but um in classification problems or essentially where we want to assign a category to an image or region or pixel um, we can be correct or wrong in a prediction in two ways right so um uh up here and and you might see these axes flipped on confusion matrices and that's not you know one way or another it's uh just the idea that here we have uh on along the top here we have a case where we are actually an object right so that's a positive that the image or a region or a pixel is actually associated with an object right this is our ground truth this is what we really know to be true maybe in our label or something like that right and then, uh, or maybe it's not an object, right? So it's a background or it's a different something something else, right? So if we're looking at an image for cars and uh, that image is a car or that uh, rectangular region of that image is a car, then okay, we fall into this area. But if it's a tree or some other background, then we'd fall over here, right? And then along this axis, we'd have the predicted as an object. So this is what our model's outputting, right? So uh, our total is P plus N, right? Our total positives and our total negatives, right? So we have a uh, quantized or uh, you know, uh, county countable 
number of instances here. And uh, we're going to look at uh, true positives. We're going to define those as where it actually is an object and we were predicted as an object, right? So yay, that's good. Uh, how about the case where it's actually not an object and we also predicted it was not an object? We call that a true negative. That's good too. Uh, but sometimes it actually is an object, but uh, we it is not an object, but we predicted it as an object so that's a false positive we thought it was positive but we were false about that we were wrong right so it's a false positive or conversely it may actually be an object but we fail to see it as one right so that's a negative but it's a false negative right so tp fp fn and, and tm right so um you want most of your values so when you uh, would produce a report um, to publish, present, give to your boss, whatever, your colleagues, uh, you want these values here to be uh, large, right? The, the counts that if you had uh, a data set of a thousand uh, images and uh, uh, then you ran a prediction on that after you trained your model, you would want all your values to either be in here or here and to have very low counts in uh, these offset diagonals. So with that, now we can calculate accuracy, right? So how well are we doing at classification? So this is uh, important because we'll see a little bit of a, a course uh, type of thing, right? So um, here we would have our uh, true positives plus our true negatives divided by the total count, right? So our true positives, our false positives, our true negatives, and our false negatives, or P plus N, right? So uh, we want to maximize our accuracy, right? So that, that would be great, it just uh, to maximize that. But sometimes true positive versus false positive is more or less important than true negative versus false negative. So um, can you, do you, maybe you can turn your microphone on or, or type into the chat. Can you think about in unmanned autonomous vehicles when it might be more important to weight one versus the other, right? That, um, you know, you're, you're, might be uh, concerned about um, false positives and minimizing false positives and false negatives, but what um, what would be uh, some examples where we might want to wait one uh, versus another? Maybe in a situation where uh, you're trying to do threat detection. Okay. Uh, and how, how would that apply? What would we be concerned about there? You'd be concerning about having false positives with threats, which might have, you know, if it, if the drone was able to then deploy a missile and kill somebody, they'd be killing somebody that would not be a threat and would actually be a civilian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Good. So there, uh, you know, we want to uh, uh, find the bad guys to uh, to target, but uh, uh, we don't want to accidentally or mistakenly classify someone as a, a positive threat that's not right. So um, that let's see, that would be a false uh, positive if, if positive means that they're a threat. And uh, so we would really want to minimize our false positives, right? Uh, we, we really want to minimize collateral damage. Um, yeah, any, anything else? Anyone else? So what about if we're uh, you know, driving along and we're near an intersection and um, you know we're trying to classify uh, things around us, right? Uh, would we 
would we be interested more interested in um, minimizing false positives or or false negatives there? I would say false negatives. Okay, yeah, because if uh, if we fail to recognize that there's uh, you know a, a child in a crosswalk, uh, that could end badly, right? So uh, we would really want to minimize uh, 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 the false. Uh, negatives or or misses there, right? So, okay. So I, I think you get the point. There's a number of different uh, considerations, and you can think about that some more. Uh, but lots of different uh, uh, situations where we may want to emphasize uh, one or another. Um, where was I? All right. So. Um, Okay, so uh, because of that, we kind of split these up, right? So accuracy was this total total positives and total negatives over the total, right? And we want to maximize our, our accuracy there, right? And um, but that that doesn't give us any idea on on how well we're doing relative to positives versus negatives. Uh, precision. Uh, here is when we uh, are dividing our true positives divided by all of the things that we uh, uh, concluded were positives, right? So, uh, you know, when we're developing a model, we, we know our ground truth, right? So we know the number of true positives we have. And then, um, so then our model predicts a certain number of uh, true positives and and false positives, right? And so, what? Uh, how well did we do on uh, identifying uh, true positives, right? So, uh, sometimes this is also known as a positive predictive value so this is relevant when we want to avoid a false positive right so we're uh wanting to minimize the false positives so this is closer to one right and uh so uh in other words the cost of a false positive is high. And so um, that example of a uh, targeting system where we've uh, identified uh, something as a enemy combatant uh, and a threat, and we want to uh, neutralize that uh, threat, then uh, we want to make sure that we minimize those false positives. All right, but then we also have uh, recall. And now here, this is uh, slightly different. It's the total positives divided by the, uh, I'm sorry, the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives, right? So uh, those that we concluded were uh, negative, but we we're false at it. Well, conversely, those are really true, right? So, um, uh, this is our true positive rate or the sensitivity. So here, this is relevant when the cost of a false negative is, is high. So baby in a crosswalk uh, type situation, a, uh, a, a truck crossing in front of us, um, a, a uh, car coming towards us, um, that type of thing, right? Any anything where uh, there's uh, risk, we want to make sure that we're uh, we're actually detecting that risk. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, there's a couple other ways we can uh, visualize this. So, when we uh, you know classify things, somewhere in there, there's some sort of threshold. Right. So if we're um, well, if you take my communications course next uh, semester, then sometimes we're trying to figure out whether 
uh, a signal that we receive is a bit zero or a bit one, right? And we um, that might be encoded to certain voltages or signal levels. And so we might set a threshold and anything, let's say, below zero and a negative value we might assign to uh, a zero or anything above zero we might assign to a one, right? So zero is our threshold there. Um, or it could be that we're, uh, we're only dealing with positive signals and we've got uh, something at uh, uh, zero and uh, something at 10 volts, right? So, you know, kind of makes sense to set that threshold at five volts. But that assumes that we're looking for um, kind of that uh, true positive versus false positives kind of the same way, right? So um, ultimately, we're, we're setting a threshold. Uh, and where is the best place to set that threshold? Is it right in the middle? Uh, well, that depends on uh, how much we're interested in these different um, uh, rates, right? So this is called the receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, it should be smooth up here. Sorry, this is why I'm an engineer and not an artist. But um, uh, this is plotted for various different thresholds, right? So this it has origins in radar uh, in World War II. And the idea of, uh, um, as we just discussed, is that a threat or not? Is that a target or not? And in radar systems, if you've ever used one, if uh, Maybe you're a boater, or maybe you're in the military. Uh, you you might have looked at radar screens before, right? And they can have a lot of noise associated with them, and it's not always easy to figure out that oh, that's a um, that's an object versus just some noise, right? So we set thresholds, and hopefully that uh, the threshold's high enough that the noise doesn't trigger it, but it's low enough that even a weak target will will trigger it, right? So um, if, our, uh, if we're up here, we're seeing a high true positive rate and um, um, but also kind of a high uh, false positive rate. Uh, down here, we're seeing low false positive rates, but also uh, low true positive rates, right? So um, uh, this might be a better regime to operate in right, where we have high uh, true positive rates, but still pretty low false positive rates, right? So uh, depending upon the shape of this curve and if it's uh, just a straight line versus very bent, right, if it's a straight line, we're not getting much of a trade-off between false positives and true positives, uh, right? So they're, they're both increasing as we change our threshold. Uh, so we actually want a curve that is bent like this. So uh, that you know is kind of a visual description of things, and uh, but we uh, can also uh, go numerical here and now trade off our recall and precision. Right. So you recall that we had. Accuracy is just a generic uh, value. And uh, then we split that up into recall and precision. And now we can look at the harmonic mean of precision value and our, uh, our recall and our precision values, right? So this is kind of the equation, two is there for scaling reasons. And uh, so this, this maybe is, uh, kind of reminiscent of a couple of resistors in parallel or something like that, right? So uh, that's a, a similar type of uh, thing where we're looking at the harmonic mean of a value. And so this F1 score is uh, simply that, right? And we have, uh, if we plug in some values and we rearrange, we've got two times the number of true positives uh, divided by two times the number of true positives plus number of false positives and the number of false negatives. So it's kind of combining these two, right? Um, more generally, we can define an F beta. 
and the beta now is giving a little bit of weighting to either precision or or recall right so um uh, here uh, from a harmonic mean standpoint we're weighting them equally but we can uh we can tweak these so i've seen people talk about an f2 before most of the time you're just going to see an f1 but you might see something like an f2 uh where beta is now uh two and you're just waiting one over the other all right um intersection over union now we will use this one uh in uh later in our discussions and so uh this one's uh particularly relevant uh you will see these other things in in practice and so they're important but uh this one's particularly important as you might guess from this picture for object detection right so um here we've got a car and our green is our ground truth our human has labeled this let's say and they've done a pretty good job of that um, b you're in purple is our um prediction right so uh model not doing too well maybe uh maybe it could be better uh could be worse but uh it's thinking that that's a car but its bounding box is is offset some right it's a little bit larger and a little bit offset it looks like so um how do we how do we assess how well that's doing so intersection over union is exactly what it says it's a measure of overlap of the ground truth and a predicted rectangles where we put the intersection of these two bounding boxes or rectangles right uh and divide that by the union of the two right so if we if we look at this, hopefully I got this right. It took me a couple of stabs at it, right? So C is the uh, overlap of these two rectangles in the uh, horizontal dimension. And D is the overlap in the vertical dimension. So that's uh, C times D is our intersection, right? Intersection is multiplication, union is... Uh, tends to be addition, right? So here we've got, um, uh, for the denominator, we uh, would take uh, E is the, so the horizontal size of the green rectangle times F and plus G times H, right? So the total uh, uh, union area there. So, um, so, uh, I over U is, uh, and let me kind of show that here. Uh, that's uh, teal color there, cross hashed is our intersected uh, area. So uh, an IOU of greater than 0.5 is considered correct as a course rule of thumb. And um, so I'm just kind of pausing here. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this is uh, my denominator main not be uh correct because i think we double counted some of that area but uh so but this is definitely correct right so it's the intersection divided by the union in terms of uh in terms of area and uh like i say here i think we've uh we're double counting some stuff there um so the iou helps us evaluate how well we predict the bounding box and object detection and we'd like perfect overlap between our ground truth label and our prediction. Right? So, uh, so that's an important one. You may also see AP and um, uh, mean AP. Uh, I I don't uh, uh, see this as as often, but it's uh, talked about in some research papers and that type of thing. So here we're we're plotting precision and recall it's a little bit like a receiver characteristic uh receiver operating characteristic curve um but we're uh we're plotting instead of uh true positives and, and false positives we're plotting precision and recall and uh, for different thresholds right and uh so this uh ap is the uh area under the curve but um we often see this kind of uh, sawtooth 
behavior in uh, practice, but um, uh, we will generally make it mo monotonic, right? So this would be non-monotonic because our slope changes as we go through here, but uh, um, we kind of force it to monotonic by taking the maximum value within an interval, right? So uh, that uh, maximum value would be over here. So we we just kind of lift this part up there and then calculate that. So, um, all right, so you may see that in some research papers. So I'm including that one for completeness. All right, so now let's, um, how are we doing on time here? So, um, all right, good, actually. Um, so let's pivot back to looking at object detection and start to look at how we might implement an object detection uh, algorithm. So, um, you know, we have to figure out how do we label our data, right? So neural networks trained with that propagation are, uh, you know, reliant. It's a supervised learning uh, situation where we already have our answers for our training data set. And then we use back propagation and gradient descent to kind of force all those parameters of the model to give us predictions that match what we know should be, right? So um, so the first thing we need to do is label our, um, our objects, right? So we're gonna have a whole bunch of images and we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna look for certain number of classes, right? So this might be cars, pedestrians, bicycles, something like that, right? Uh, could be cars, uh, pedestrians, stoplights, um, three is not magic, uh, typically is to be more than that, um, depending upon how complex of a problem you're tackling, right? So, uh, but each class would uh, get a position here in this vector that we're using to label our images. And so if uh, we, uh, and it goes along with this PC here, right? So the probability of a class. And in a label, uh, we our, our probabilities are either zero or one, right? So we know that a class has been detected. And if it has, we'll, we'll put a one there and we'll fill in the appropriate value here for C1, C2, or C3, right? And if it's car, we'll make this one and then these, the remaining one zero. Right? So I call that one hot encoded, uh, if you remember your digital uh, circuits class. Uh, or if it's a uh, pedestrian and, and we want to map that to class two here, uh, so it'd be zero, one, and zero. Now, if we don't detect a class, we're just seeing background uh, 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 things in our, uh, in our image, right? So then we put a zero in here. In that case, none of these other values matter. Right? They can be anything, but uh, we'll just, you know, leave them zero or something like that, right? So we're going to ignore them if this is zero, right? But if it's one, we're going to fill in values, right? So we talked about the classes there. Uh, for each of those that actually have an instance of class in the image, then we're going to specify the bounding box, right? So we'll have an X and a Y position coordinate for... Uh, the bounding box, and then we can have a width and a height uh, for that bounding box. Now, you can imagine there's a few other ways of specifying a rectangle. You could uh, specify opposite corners uh, in terms of their location, um, or, uh, and, uh, you know, you have to kind of decide where is the origin of your coordinate system uh, when you're specifying X and Y is at the top left corner of the bounding box or is at the center point of the bounding box? So uh, some choices there and neither neither right nor wrong. And some of the work we'll look at will tend to map these to the center point, right? But uh, you need some sort of convention and you need to stick with it, right? And then it needs to be uh, compatible with your, your model and training process, right? So, uh, but we would have one of these or as we'll see in some cases, more of these uh, for each image. 
And uh, so at that, that kind of basic level, if we have one object in each image, we would have one of these uh, labels for each of the images that we would look at, right? So now how, what it, what we do from there, right? So we could um, have a uh, sliding window implementation. Uh, this is <clears throat> not really how most uh, modern implementations work, but it's uh, it's it's useful to look at uh, from a historical standpoint. And there there are still some systems that operate this way, right? So uh, what we might do is train on tightly cropped images, right? So we might take uh, different vehicles, uh, different views of the vehicle, and we might, you know, train a system that can recognize uh, things like that, right? And then we might partition the image into many different uh, regions, right? And then we would test each region by a sliding window. So let's look up here. Do we see anything that looks like a car? Nope, okay, let's move to the next one. Let's just step over a little ways and look again, right? Still nothing, still nothing, right? So we we would slide that window all the way uh, across, right? And uh, oh, there we might see uh, a vehicle, right? So this is starting to look like a vehicle when we look here. So uh, here we have some vehicles in that uh, image also, and there's that would probably produce a pretty good result right there, right? So um, and so we would uh, go through that. We scan our image, then we might repeat for. Uh, some different sizes of these rectangles, these cells that we're sliding across. We might use, you know, we might start with a really small one and then uh, work to bigger ones or vice versa, right? So uh, we're trying to find uh, big cars and little cars and trying to find that rectangle that best matches that car, right? So uh, there we're, we're pretty good. Our intersection over Union here would not be too bad, right? So we have a lot more, uh, if we uh, assumed all that whole thing was a rectangle, um, we we have more than we need, but we're, uh, we're covering it pretty well, right? So um, ultimately, as you can imagine, this is very computationally expensive, right? So, um, so no, okay, so, um, now let's compare that to YOLO. Uh, you only look once, and this is uh, a, a relatively modern. I think 2015. So uh, it's it's modern in the grand scheme of things. A very classic uh, work, and uh, so important. But um, um, obviously, lots of uh, work has been done since it. Right. So um, here we're going to use CNNs to look at all of these things in parallel at the same time. Uh, again, for the sake of time, I don't think we'll um, we we have time to look into how we actually implement that. But um, uh, the essence here is that we're going to for each grid cell right here i think one two did i do this nine by nine i think yeah so uh typically this might be 19 by 19 but that gets too messy so i did nine by nine and uh so for each grid cell we'll label that image right so uh so you can see for many of these grid cells this PC is going to be zero because there's not an object of interest there. And uh, then all these other values do not care, right? But let's say one of our classes is a stoplight or certainly it's going to be a car or something like that, right? So some of these um, cells are going to have PC is equal to one for a label and we will have values uh, incorporated in these, right? So. 
In the label data set, only add an object to the cell that includes the center point, BX, BY. Okay, huh. So let's look at this uh, police car over here on the left. We see that it's showing up in about six different cells, right? So, uh, but we the way we want this to work is that we want to uh, say that that's a center point, right? The, the labeler has determined that that's the, the center point of this vehicle uh, in this image. And um, that is represented by BXBY. Remember I said there's a number of different ways we can represent these bounding boxes, these rectangles. And uh, so here we're gonna use, we're gonna interpret BX and BY to be the center point. And then uh, the BW and BH are the uh, sizes of the uh, bounding box, um, uh, you know, uh, origined at BX and BY. And that uh, all these values are relative to the cell, right? So uh, for any given cell, the top left corner might be 0, 0, and the bottom right corner might be 1, 1, and then uh, BX and BY would be some fraction of 1, uh, uh, where it shows up, right? So this police car would be uh, labeled to be in this cell, right? PC equal to one and car C1 would be equal to one and C2 and C3 would be zeros. And then uh, the BX and BY, uh, so BX might be 0 0.2, 0 0.15 or 0.2 and uh, BY might be, if that's the origin zero, zero, uh, that might be 0.9 or something, right? So 0.2 and 0.9, and then uh, the BH and uh, uh, BW and BH would be uh, relative to that, right? So, um, and then for this cell, this label would give us a PC of zero, right? Because it's, even though it has a car there, it's uh, center point is not in that cell. So any given object is only going to uh, have a, um, uh, an appearance of this label in one of the cells, right? So uh, here I've got nine cells by nine cells and um, uh, uh, eight, uh, so we have eight elements here, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, basically, it's gonna be uh, one, two, three, four, five, plus the number of classes that you have, right? So if you have um, not just uh, cars, pedestrians, and bicyclists, but also trucks, stoplights, and motorcyclists, and um, whatnot. Right, so uh, maybe you want to get very specific about certain certain objects, right? So you're going to have more C's, right? So it's going to be five plus the number of classes is this last uh, value here, right? So our output is that product, right? Six hundred and forty-eight in this kind of simplified case. So our output layer is going to uh, have um, six hundred and forty-eight. Uh, outputs from these neurons, right, and that output layer that are going to be uh, set or predicting in forward propagation, predicting these values, and then um, uh, back propagation, trying to match those values to the labels, right? So, uh, yeah, and, and if we're using a finer grid than this, like 19 by 19, then we're scaling up from there, right? So a uh, big, big networks here, right? Wide, wide networks. Uh, all right. So um, now, what about uh, when we're actually kind of predicting things, right? And and forward propagation. Uh, this cell here is probably going to see a car and it might classify that but it might think that it's in it 
itself, right? Maybe it's really proud of itself that it found a uh, a car, and uh, uh, so it thinks the center point lies within itself. So it's uh, going to emit a PC of point seven in this case it's just a number i made up but it uh, somehow it has 0.7 you know probability that that's a car and it's going to emit a bounding box with the bxby within its cell and a um uh you know width and and height associated with that and then it'll set c1 equal to one and C2 and C3 equal to zero and so on, right? And this cell's gonna do the same thing, right? It, it thinks that there's a car there and it thinks that there's, uh, that its center point lies within itself. And so it's going to emit values, right? So you remember that our, our output is gonna be, you know, at least 648, right? For, or, for this for this particular case or or maybe much larger right so uh each cell is going to emit these values right so uh, maybe this cell up here is going to emit pc is equal zero and do not cares for all the others right um and and so on but these two uh cells are gonna uh each perhaps thinks that there's uh there's an object there, and it's going to uh, emit a probability uh, of, of classification and a bounding box, and then the class ID. So, uh, how do we deal with that? Do we want to deal with that? Well, uh, this is going to result in multiple bounding boxes per object, right? So, we would kind of like to have the best one, um, but. Uh, but how do we get there, right? Well, there's a little algorithm we can try. And that would be, first of all, go through this whole thing, right? And um, uh, for each cell, uh, any any boxes, any cells with low probabilities, you know, PC, that first element and that output vector for each cell, if they're, let's say, less than 0.6, that's low enough that we don't think it, uh, it is concluding that there's anything there. All right, so we're gonna get rid of a bunch of boxes right away in that case. Then, while we have boxes remaining, uh, now we're going to um, um, go through and pick, uh, pick a box with the largest PC, right? Uh, and then, as a, and output that as a prediction. Right, so we're going to uh, you know we have these boxes here. I think I may have said cells earlier, but um, we're we're ranking all these boxes, all these bounding boxes, and we're going to um, discard those with low probabilities, right? And then we're going to start with the maximum probability. Uh, you know, in this case, we're probably going to have boxes for these other cars here, and maybe these stoplights and that top of line, right? But um, uh, in this case, we've got uh, this one here that has a maximum uh, predicted probability of 0.8, right? Now we're going to suppress all others with a high IOU with respect to this box here, right? So we'll calculate um, uh, the IOU for this box overlapping with this box. If it has a high IOU, it's probably trying to uh, classify and locate the same object, right? Uh, if we have a box over here around this truck over here on the right, well, that's going to have basically an IOU of zero compared to this green one, right? Because there's no overlap. The intersection is zero. The numerator is zero, so uh, the IOU is zero. Um, so we're only going to suppress others with a high IOU, right? So we're going to, we're going to get rid of this red one or pink one or whatever that is, right? Because it overlaps quite a bit. And so it has a high IOU and we're going to, uh, discard that. So we, uh, since we picked the highest probability one, we're going to retain this one and we'll discard that one. 
but we won't discard these guys, right? Because they they're not uh, overlapping enough uh, to suppress, right? So then uh, we'll go through and uh, you know maybe look at the next highest probability class and work our way through all the boxes, right? So we have no boxes. We tend to do this independently for each output class, right? So we might look at all the boxes that classified with some percentage uh, to a um, to a car, right? C1, where C1 is positive. And then um, we'll look at, uh, after we're done processing all those, then we'll look at ones that uh, now have a, um, um, you know, are classifying for a stoplight, let's say, and uh, work work through all those, right? So, all right, so this helps us uh, avoid the situation where uh, multiple cells are predicting that there's an object in them and it turns out to be the same object, right? So uh, by the time we're done with this, we should have one bounding box per um, per object in our view, All right? So, um, so that's good. Uh, what happens if we have more than one object of interest in a region, right? So um, here, um, uh, we go back here and it's like, okay, well, each of these regions is looking at, all right, is that a C1, C2, or C3? Well, that's a, um, a, a C1 in this case, right? But, uh, we got a stoplight right there. Maybe it, it's seen this, uh, uh, pole here. Uh, and and knows that, well, that's kind of like a stoplight, right? So maybe in this cell, we've got a little bit of a truck and we've got a little bit of a stoplight, right? What is, uh, how do we uh, handle that situation, right? So if we have more than one object of interest in a region, so we can use anchor boxes. And I'm just going to introduce this concept here. So, but the idea is that uh, some of these objects have different aspect ratios, right? So a car in profile is going to have kind of a, a, a low uh, rectangle, right? But it's short but long, right, with a car in profile. Uh, if it was in um, head-on condition, maybe it would be a little bit more square, but maybe still a little bit, little bit longer than tall, but not quite as extreme aspect ratio as this, right? Then we might have a pedestrian. Uh, they're gonna have a more vertical type of anchor box. And a, um, a stoplight might have one that's even narrower than that, right? But still kind of vertically oriented for a lot of stoplights. Some stoplights are horizontally mounted, so you would need some anchor boxes for that. So. Uh, here I've, I've got two examples, maybe five might be uh, useful, right? So um, the idea that you would have many more than five uh, objects all in the same cell, especially when you consider that this is nine by nine and we might actually be using something more like 19 by 19, right? So now each cell is pretty small and the likelihood of more than five objects showing up in that um, same cell is pretty low, right? So, um, but the idea now here is that we can uh, look at objects and now we can match these uh, to certain aspect ratios. Well, how would we do that? Well, um, you know, same type of situation, except now we might have one of these labels for each anchor box, right? So an anchor box is a particular aspect ratio. And uh, so if we have five of them, then maybe we have five of these for each cell. Most of these, the PC is going to be zero, right? But we're going to have 
uh, you know, two, three, four, five of each of these for uh, every cell. And in this case, we might have, uh, we might say that's a stoplight and its center point lies within the cell. Um, so the car would, um, you know, we would have one of these vectors with an anchor box that's kind of a, a, a short and wide anchor box and we would mark that PC is equal to one in our label. And then in that same cell, our, we would uh, mark an anchor box that would be tall and vertical. And we would uh, uh, mark that with the PC of uh, one and then the corresponding uh, class we would also flag, right? So all we're really doing is kind of coming up with these different uh, anchor boxes and then setting those, um, uh, setting our labels accordingly and then teaching the system to match to those. All right, so uh, uh, lots more uh, to that. I think the yellow paper uh, talks about that. That's linked in Moodle. If you click through on the week, week eight and uh you go into that uh there's you know reading assignments and that type of thing right and uh i think i've marked both the yolo paper and the U unit paper which uh brings us to semantic segmentation so uh we we started very briefly with the discussion of image classification right where we would look at a whole image and we would say that image is a cat or that image is a dog or it's a person or a car or something like that right so we're we're classifying the whole image and eh, i kind of made the comment that that's not terribly useful in uh autonomous vehicles um and so then we we looked at object detection and now we're looking at trying to um find rectangular regions that best enclose objects of interest and uh, locate those within our, our field of vision. And that's that's object detection, what we just talked about, right? And and so we, we start off with trying to find one object, uh, but then we have a situation where we have multiple objects in the image, multiple different kinds of objects, different classes, and then even in a a cell, a, a, a given cell, we might have multiple uh, different things, right? And so we we use this uh, YOLO concept that then uh, we have this non-max uh, suppression and um, the, whatever I just talked about was the, uh, I got to go back and look, anchor boxes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, blanking must be uh, coming time for a break, yeah. Um, all right, uh, yeah, actually let's, we only have a couple of slides here, but let's go ahead and take a quick break. Uh, I think we'll uh, be able to finish early today, uh, surprisingly. And uh, uh, so uh, let's, let's go until eight o'clock your time, seven o'clock central time. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, pick up here when we come back.